All right, well, hello everybody and welcome to our Grow Native webinar, Native Gardening for Native Flies with information on natural mosquito control with Ed Spivak. Uh, the Grow Native program is the native plant marketing and education program of the Missouri Prairie Foundation. My name is Brooke Widmar. I'm the director of administrative operations and member engagement for the foundation. And I wanna thank all of you for joining us for this class. I also wanna take a moment to recognize and thank our Grow Native sponsors uh, who are listed here on the screen. So during the presentation and during the Q&A section, if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A section on your screen. Uh, when Ed is done presenting, Carol will come on to ask those, uh, those questions to him. So you know the webinar is being recorded. The link will be shared with everybody tomorrow along with links to any resources mentioned during the presentation. So to introduce today's speaker, um, Ed Spivak is the director of St. Louis Zoo's Wild Care Institute Center for Native Pollinator Conservation. He serves as the program officer for a bumblebee specialist group and holds leadership in many other pollinator organizations, including Missourians for Monarchs. Uh, through the Center for Native Pollinator Conservation, Ed has also begun working with Native American tribes and nations through an initiative called Native Foods, Native Peoples, Native Pollinators. So without further ado, take it away, Ed. Thank you very much, Brooke. So we might as well get started. So today I'm gonna to be talking about native gardening for native flies and also just talking about flies and how you really should start appreciating them more from a variety of perspectives. And there's the appreciation and there's also some concern. And that's why we're gonna be talking about natural mosquito control, but the biggest thing is concerns about how you deal with them. But first I would like to start with a land acknowledgement. We would like to acknowledge that the St. Louis Zoo is located on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Osage Nation and the Illini Confederacy. We also acknowledge that this area and parts of Missouri have been traditionally used by others, including the Pawnee, Sac and Fox, Dakota, Lakota, Oto, Missouri, Omaha, Iowa, Quapaw, Chickasaw, Kickapoo, and the Haudenosaunee. The process of knowing and acknowledging the ground beneath our feet is a way of honoring and expressing gratitude for the people on this land before us. It familiarizes visitors with the cultures and histories of Missouri's indigenous tribes, as well as with their ties in the St. Louis region. We honor our heritage of native peoples and what they teach us about stewardship of the earth. And then part of that stewardship is looking at all life. And one of those forms of life we don't tend to think about too much unless they bother us one way or another are flies. So why should we be concerned about flies? Well, first off, in North America, there were 20,000 known species of flies, and uh, some we're still finding more and more all the time. But the biggest issue is their value. Flies are, as a majority, are decomposers. They clean up the waste. They're, that includes the plants, fungi, and carry. And this is also one reason that they're sometimes problematic in our houses, too, because unfortunately, we have some waste that we can't necessarily deal with, and that's why flies come in. Many of them are beneficial predators. I'll be talking about that in a little bit. They're important pollinators. Uh, most people don't tend to think about flies as pollinators. We'll, we'll be talking about that. But there is also that caveat too that flies do transmit disease. You know, the biggest ones we think about are mosquitoes, which are flies, uh, but there are other diseases which can be transmitted by them or by other animals utilizing them. So whether you think of you know, bot flies um, you know, in the tropics or you know, tsetse in Africa, transmitting sleeping sickness or nagana in cattle. So there are, but when we look at flies as a group, most of them are actually pretty benign. We have a tendency to focus on you know, the animals that we have issues with. But first off, what is a fly? A lot of people may not know that much about flies. They belong to the insect order Diptera, which means two wings. So if you look at a fly, you'll actually, if you look closely, you'll only really see two wings. You know, this comparison to dragonflies are obviously, you know, you can see the uh, four wings. When you look at bees and wasps, they have four wings, but you may not necessarily see that second pair of wings. Butterflies, also four wings. In flies, the second pair of wings has been modified. And if you look at the picture here on the right, these, and in this particular species, 
of fly. They're actually fairly large. These little bulbous projections are called halteers. And halteers actually kind of act as a gyroscopic stabilizer. So when we think of you know, launching a missile or rocket into space, or even sometimes flying, there are various devices that are uh, used within the system to be able to balance, to orient the animal, um, or in the case of rockets, in a particular orientation. These halteers are constantly vibrating, and this allows them to maneuver very quickly, to be able to fly upside down, to be able to land easily on, you know, you know upside down on a ceiling, whatever it is. But those stabilizers really act to allow the fly that fantastic movement we often see, which also makes it sometimes very difficult to, to deal with them when we want to. Flies like you know, butterflies, bees and wasps and ants um, have complete metamorphosis. So there's the adult who lays eggs. Those eggs become a larva. We tend to call them maggots for flies in general. They go through several stages, just like when we think of those life stages um, within caterpillars. Then they become a pupa. And then from that pupa, they reorganize inside and become the next adult fly. They have very large compound eyes. This is also, um, I'll show you a little bit, one easy way to recognize them from a lot of other insects. If you can't see the two types of wing or just two wings, they have very short antenna. Um, and then their mouth parts are fairly flexible depending upon the species. So some of them are designed to just kind of mop up, think of a housefly. If you ever look closely at a housefly when it lands on a little bit of something either at your picnic um, or in your house, it lowers its mouth part and it has basically kind of this spongy uh, uh, how best, uh, lips basically that allows it to kind of suck up liquid. Some like mosquitoes, uh, they have a modified mouth to be able to pierce through flesh. And then some, if you've ever unfortunately had to deal with something like a horsefly, that you know, kind of spongy mouth part, those lips are actually now have teeth and they literally take a divot out of your skin. So they have a variety of mouth parts depending upon their feeding options. So the flies that we mostly encounter, and I'm going to show pictures of some of the more incredible flies, but are the usual suspects we tend to think about for flies. House flies, of course, often constantly, you know, either surrounding our garbage. Uh, but as I said, these are important for decomposition, for dealing with the waste that we produce a lot of. Flesh flies are often feeding on dead and decaying uh, material, uh, usually animal matter. Um, oftentimes you may see these before you actually see the, the dead animal. So for example, my wife and I used to live in an area of St. Louis called Dogtown. And one summer we started seeing all these flesh flies suddenly appearing and we'd see them in the window. It almost kind of seemed like you know, something out of Amityville horror. You'd see about a dozen flies and all of a sudden, why are there flesh flies in the house? And we looked all over, couldn't smell anything but for a couple of weeks, just constant flesh flies. And then when we finally we bought a new house and we moved and we cleaned up the basement, we found out what had happened, that there is most likely one of our cats had brought in a, a, a baby bunny. Uh, it had died and all that was left was a skeleton. The flesh flies had cleaned it up completely. Uh, you could tell that it wasn't eaten by the cat because it was completely articulated. But the flesh flies had found it, and all it took was one flesh fly to get into the house to deal with it. Blow flies, um, we often mistake these for house flies, but uh, the blow flies and uh, blue bottle and green bottle flies often have a nice metallic green or blue sheen to them. Cluster flies, we don't tend to see all that often. They tend to deal with earthworms. Fruit flies and forward flies are two very common species we tend to get in houses and in businesses. Uh, because also they're going for, you know, any sort of debris, decomp decomposing material. If you've got some fruit out for a long time, it's the fruit flies who are normally showing up. Fruit flies are incredibly important because of their use in genetic studies and understanding the whole field of genetics, but we have a tendency to, to get them. Uh, they're actually a fairly easy one to deal with, too. You can put out a small dish of some wine, because actually fruit flies technically 
uh, what we have get in our houses are actually vinegar flies. They're actually going for the, the vinegar and the alcohol. So you can put out just a shallow dish of, you know, it's like some old cheap wine with a drop of like Dawn dish soap in it. So it breaks the surface. And if you've got a, a big issue with fruit flies, they'll just go in there. Forward flies are often confused with the fruit flies. They're about the same size, but two characteristics about them. One is they will often uh, run or jump. So sometimes they're called jumping flies. But if you look at them, they also have this very prominent hump. You know, even though they're very small, if you look, they're, they have kind of an arched back to them. Now, forward flies are ones which will feed on a lot of rotting material, so animal or plant. So even things in your drains. So if you haven't cleaned out your drains, you sometimes get that buildup of gunk and those uh, forward fly maggots will feed on that gunk. Another one you tend to find coming out of our sinks, um, I often see them coming out of the bathroom sinks in particular, are the moth flies or drain flies. Uh, very small, but very broad wings. Uh, they actually have a little bit of fringe, uh, fringing to the wings themselves, but they kind of look like little moths, but they're actually you know, flies. And they feed on that, that scum, that gelatinous material that's caught in sinks and drains. So that's why you periodically see them suddenly, they show up out of nowhere and some, suddenly in your sinks. Um, and then midges, of course, they're going for, they look like mosquitoes, but don't have biting mouth parts. Uh, but they're also ones that you'll find, you know, around standing water. Um, really looking at them, there are some body posture differences between them and mosquitoes, uh, but they're also part of the cleanup crew. So when you look at all of these flies I'm showing here, they're really part of the cleanup crew and oftentimes from the messes that we make. But when you really start looking at the flies in your garden, you can see some incredible ones, and particularly the surfids, the hoverflies or flower flies. So like this one, uh, genus Allograpta, very small. This is on a sunflower, uh, but many of them will have striping patterns looking like little wasps or bees. They cannot sting themselves, but they're using that as a mimic uh, way to protect themselves. So if a, any sort of predator or anything which has had a bad experience with a bee or wasp sees this striping pattern, this warning coloration, they have a tendency to leave them alone. So they're using that as that uh, mimicry for bees and wasps. Drone flies, we have several species of drone flies. These are a bit bigger, huskier than the, <clears throat> um, uh, the other fruit flies. Oftentimes their maggots are called rat-tailed maggots because they're feeding on, you know, kind of often very foul, stagnant pools of water, or even in the bodies of other animals where there might be a pool as it's kind of slowly breaking down. So here's one, Aristolus dimidiatus. This one, Aristolus tenex, is interesting. Um, and I want to point out a couple things here too. Um, as I mentioned, the easy ways to tell a fly from a bee or a wasp or other species, you know, there's the two wings, of course. Um, but sometimes you may not be able to tell right away. Look at the head. And this one is a classic example showing the head. Big, huge, multifaceted compound eyes. Uh, in this particular species, they even come together on top of their head. So it looks like a big bullet head or shield. You do not have this with wasps or bees, which you might confuse them with. And then also very, very short antenna. Both wasps and bees have much longer antenna. So almost no or very short antenna and these very large um, helmet-like or bullet-shaped heads with their compound eyes. Now, the one thing I wanted to mention about this one, Aristolus tenex, this is actually not a native species to North America. And when I first you know, started photographing bees and flies and particularly honeybees, if you notice the color is very much like a honeybee, it's that kind of orangish, amber color with the dark stripes. And I started thinking, well, why is there a fly that looks like a honeybee since honeybees are not native? This fly from Europe was accidentally introduced, but it is a mimic on honeybees. So it's interesting, we've introduced the honeybee and by accident introduced this drone fly, which is a mimic of the honeybee. Uh, 
This one, Aristalis transversa, one of our native drone flies, you can see different color than yellow and black, which you can find in some wasps, but um, also like with our Carter bees. Again, you can see that bullet-shaped helmet-like head and very short antenna. This one I, I really love because they look like a, a mosquito on steroids. It's a type of bee fly. And many of these flies that I'm showing right now are very important pollinators. And these are the ones you're gonna see most in the garden. The, the first usual suspects are ones you'll tend to find around the house, your garbage. But when we start talking about setting up a garden and supporting the flies, it's all of these types of bee flies, hover flies, and drone flies are really attracting. And these Levitophora, there are several species, and some can be very large, but they do look like you know, a mosquito on steroids. Daffodil flies. This one, actually, the uh, maggots feed on uh, daffodil bulbs. So it's actually rather a specialist on it. The adults are pollinators, but the young could be potentially damaging to some of our flowers. So sometimes there's a trade-off we often have to deal with. Thick-headed flies, this one actually is a, a parasitoid on bees and wasps, which it grabs and lays eggs upon, but often very obvious, uh, has a really good wasp mimic besides the striping pattern. You can see that nice slender abdomen, but, it, but again, those really large, um, big kind of you know, bullet helmet-shaped eyes. And there are different types of mimics. So, so this one, you usually see when the goldenrod is in bloom, uh, Spillamaya long cornus, the yellow jacket mimic fly. It's a, actually a pretty good sized fly, um, upwards of about say three quarters of an inch, sometimes even up to close to an inch long. But it, that, that black and yellow banding pattern does two things. One, it's a good mimic of yellow jackets, but I often see them on um, goldenrod. So it also actually helps them to blend in too. Some of them can be rather drab, some of the bee flies. Uh, this one I'm still trying to, to key out. This one I just uh, saw uh, just a few weeks ago in Theodore Roosevelt National Park um, on some vegetation. Uh, fairly drab, but also a very important pollinator. This is one you may see um, fairly regularly. The tiger bee fly, Xenox tigrinus. Uh, it used to be in the genus Anthrax, which is not a great uh, genus, but it's now Xenox. This is actually a parasitoid on large carpenter bees. So if you have large carpenter bees nesting in any sort of wood, you actually eventually may see this fly also hanging out. And it's a good sized fly, um, close to the size of a large carpenter bee. So it is very obvious, uh, both in flight and just sitting around. The robber flies, the acylids, uh, a very large group of predators. Uh, here's also a good example you can see you know, very short antenna, very large eyes, but here you can see that very obvious halter. The robber flies as a group are predators. Uh, they prey on everything from other flies to bees to wasps to anything that it can grab. Uh, very characteristic, these, this long slender abdomen. Uh, oftentimes you'll see a very obvious proboscis, which is used to pierce the exoskeleton of another insect. But then when you look at their legs, they're very raptorial, meaning that they can grasp. Think of like a praying mantis. So they have spines all over the insides. Um, they're kind of hooked around, so they grab their prey in midair. And then some, you know, particularly some of the bee flies, this is a slender bee fly, Garen, looks a bit like a large mosquito, but um, it doesn't have the, the feather antenna that you see. Uh, but it does still have that characteristic fly aspect, the big you know, helmet-like eyes, very short antenna. And oftentimes with the bee flies, uh, they have a uh, long tubular mouth part for sucking up nectar. These are important pollinators. And oftentimes it's just constantly rigid. So many of the bee flies, they cannot collapse or anything. You just see this, the proboscis sticking out. So as I said, particularly with a lot of the flies we just looked at are really important pollinators because those are the ones that we're really gonna be talking about. So when we look at fly pollination, you know, when we think about pollination in general, we tend to think about bees, of course, and I've talked a lot about bees. Uh, we'll think about butterflies, you know, we'll think about hummingbirds, uh, we may think about beetles, but as a group, number of studies have shown that, you know, when you look at, Next to bees, 
So this is a study that was just uh, came out last year, looking at the top non top ten non bee flower visitors, and they just looked at various commercial crops, and what percentage of those commercial crops a different species go to for pollination. Hoverflies over fifty percent um, of the crops they went to, and hoverflies as a general group are along with some of the other flies, the second most important group of pollinators next to bees. So when we start thinking about pollination services, bees are number one because of their specialty, their constancy, they're actually actively collecting pollen, but flies are the next most important group. And part of it is because of flower structure. We'll talk about that and how you attract some of these. But you can see blow flies, house flies, you'll see other types of flies, tachinids. Um, a lot of them, the adults feed on pollen and nectar whereas the adults might be feeding on something else, whether it be a dead animal or um, other insects, but as adults, they're very important pollinators. And from my own personal opinion, the most important pollinator in the world is this midge, Forsipomaya. This is the midge which pollinates chocolate, cacao. Theobroma means the food of the gods and I prefer I believe that uh, wholeheartedly. I love chocolate, um, particularly dark chocolates. But bees cannot pollinate this. Uh, most insects cannot because of the structure of the flower. And because the flowers are so small, it takes these very small midges in order to pollinate them. So flies are incredibly important. So if you are a chocoholic at all, you should really appreciate the flies. Flies are also very important for pest control. So there's one aspect of pest control where the maggots will be feeding on rotting carcasses, et cetera, which reduces incidences of bacteria and fungus, which could be harmful um, or other spreads of other disease. So that's very important. But what I'm talking about here, it's dealing with pests we may have, excuse me, in the garden. I have a window open. Just get closer, please. And the surfeits, the hoverflies in general, many of them are very important, both as a pollinator, but then the maggots are important for pest control. So this is a surfeit fly or hoverfly maggot. So what the adults do are lay their eggs in or, or on or near plants. And they are voracious predators of aphids, mealybugs, scale, so many other things. So here you got a, a double benefit from these flies. The adults are important pollinators, and then their babies are dealing with the pests. Uh, this is on some uh, cup plant from several years ago at the zoo. We had a massive outbreak of aphids on a cup plant. And then you started seeing all these surfing flies because they knew where there was a good meal. So the adults just started laying eggs all over. Some of them can be very specialized. So this, the feather leg fly, Trichopoda penipes, is actually a specialist on squash bugs. So what it does is it grabs a squash bug, lays an egg um, on one of the joints in its exoskeleton. The maggot then emerges, burrows into the body, eats it from the inside out, um, and it eventually emerges. So I've, I occasionally will see these, I'll plant you know, different types of squash in our backyard and occasionally I'll see these. So these are, ones I love to have, but the adults are feeding on pollen and nectar, but the babies are feeding on insect pests. And what that whole group is doing, they're not, as the, um, for these young, they're not, pre they're not predators um, and they're not parasites, they are parasitoids. And if you're unfamiliar with the difference between parasite and parasitoid, parasite in general, and in science you, you, you never say never, never say always, but in general, a parasite will feed on its host and not necessarily kill it. You know, sometimes the animal or human can be debilitated enough that it succumbs to something else. But parasitoids, by their very nature, kill their host. So tachinid flies, um, like this one down here, um, often you'll see, I usually see these also in goldenrod in the fall uh, after they've all emerged from various caterpillar hosts. They lay their eggs on caterpillars or other insects. As I said, that last one is also type of tachinid too. This is actually a tachinid fly. They lay their eggs, the maggots emerge, burrow their way into the uh, outer exoskeleton of the pest, 
and then feed on the inside, feeding on all the non-essential organs first, and then at the very end, the essential ones. So basically they're just keeping it alive. They don't have refrigeration, so they're just keeping the, their meal going. Uh, the caterpillar is still eating, it's still growing. So it's just this constant food reserve for it. And then eventually they emerge, uh, pupate, and produce the next generation. But beneficial flies, just like pretty much everything nowadays because of humans, are facing a lot of problems. Uh, as I said, many of them are feeders on pollen and nectar. Uh, so that lack of supplemental foods, if there's no pollen and nectar, they don't have anything to feed on. Lack of hosts or prey. So if you have beneficial flies where like the hoverflies, the maggots need aphids or other things to feed on, you know, if you have this clean garden with nothing there, you're not going to get those beneficial, you know, maggots, but then you're also not going to get the pollination services. Um, so sometimes we need to think about that balance in eradicating all pests in order to maintain a balance. They get attacked by enemies, and that could be sort of one of their own, like those robber flies or mantids or what have you. Um, conditions too, just like everything else, you know, other animals, if it's too hot, too dry, windy, dusty, overwintering sites, direct mortality. But I think the biggest one is you know, bad PR and lack of knowledge. So you know, learning more about the flies, their benefits, um, why we should look at them, and also because of their beauty. You know, hopefully some of the pictures I show show that beauty of them. So what do we do in designing beneficial fly habitat? The nice thing is, is that most of the things we can do for flies are exactly the same things we're gonna be doing for bees. So we want clumps of single species. Remember, a flower is a signpost or a billboard for a pollinator. If you've got a flower, it's telling its pollinator, I've got pollen, I've got nectar. It's telling that message. So planting clumps or repeating that planting. So more like natural foraging. Maximizing diversity. So at least 15 to 20 flower uh, species. Blooms, spring, summer, and fall. Now this is the one which is very particular for flies. Flat or open platform flower shapes, small and simple flowers. Um, whites and yellows are also very attractive. Now, some of you may know that there are a number of flies which are attracted to the smell of rotting flesh. Um, and there are a number of flowers that do produce that stink. Um, we usually don't plant them in our gardens uh, because they stink that it smells like you know, a rotting carcass or a big pile of poo. Uh, though we do plant a few plants around like Shasta daisies. Shasta daisies, if you actually get a good sniff of a Shasta daisy, they stink um, and it's really fly pollinated. So it does have that kind of off aroma that's not like a rose. So it's these flat open flower shapes and simple flowers. So when we think of things like you know, Queen Anne's lace, uh, the exotic, but also our native, uh, or I should say native, uh, our crops like uh, carrots. Carrots also have that very flat, what's called an umbiliferous flower head. That's very important for flies. And that's why flies are actually much more important pollinators for things like carrots with the, those very open blossoms of platforms than our bees. Um, and then, as I said, some which with open platforms attract both. So when we're looking at everything from sylphiums um, and helianthus, which have a nice flat blossom, they're good for bees and good for flowers, um, or just very simple structures like the goldenrod. So here you can see also just a very simple open blossom. Uh, in this particular case, the female's interested in feeding, uh, the male's interested in something else. So hopefully that gives you a brief appreciation of flies in general, but there's one group of flies that um, it's hard for people to warm up to, and that's mosquitoes. So why should we be talking about mosquitoes? Well, first off, they're flies, but they're very important in the ecosystem. So there are more than 3,500 species of mosquitoes worldwide, uh, about 175 species in the US. We have about 50 in Missouri, but we only have a few that are actually problematic. So most of them we'll never encounter, um, or they are specialists um, if they're taking blood on other types of animals and not mammals. There are some plants which are also dependent upon mosquitoes for pollination. So 
White fringeless orchid, for example, depends upon mosquitoes for pollination. It's a very small orchid. Um, it is endangered. It is one that depends upon mosquitoes. They are major components in ecosystems. So whether we're looking at the adults or the, uh, the maggots in the water, they are food for a variety of other animals. Dragonflies, fish, salamanders, frogs, lizards, etc. So they are part of the system. But as we know, there are some that are known to carry you know, diseases and some may carry more than one type of disease. But when people often say, well, let's get rid of them. You know, why do we have them? Um, I always think of this Aldo Leopold quote. Aldo Leopold is regarded as the father of wildlife management. So the last word in ignorance is the man who says of an animal or plant, what good is it? If the land mechanism as a whole is good, then every part is good, whether we understand it or not. If the biota in the course of eons has built something we like but do not understand, then who but a fool would discard seemingly useless parts? To keep every cog and wheel is the first precaution of intelligent tinkering. We have to remember the mosquitoes have been around for millions of years. There were mosquitoes around during the time of the dinosaurs, and they did not cause the extinction of anything. You know, we as humans have caused the extinction of many species, uh, but mosquitoes are part of the system. So we need to understand how to work with them and how to enjoy them, but then also for those which are problematic, how to control them. One which is now very common here in uh, Missouri is the Asian tiger mosquito, Aedes albopictus. It's actually a very pretty mosquito. Uh, this beautiful black and white tiger stripe pattern. These actually came in with the tire retread uh, trade. So, Tires were sent, and I'm going to talk about tires again in a second, were sent to the United States for retread. But if you've ever tried to get water out of a tire, you know, this is where this mosquito nests, where it lays its eggs. So it was brought in due to that sort of trade. So tires, as I said, you know, if, as I said, if you ever had to deal with a tire, um, when you're dealing with mosquitoes, there are a couple tax, two general tax that people take and deal with mosquitoes. One, well, I'll like to add a third. There's the bug zappers. Bug zappers do not work. Um, they will usually catch far more of beneficial insects than anything else. Um, they are just killing devices for beneficials as opposed to dealing with pests. So first off, bug zappers do not work. They're a waste of money. The other one that people often do is spraying. And this is one which communities often do, whether a city or a township or whatever, spraying some sort of pesticide. That pesticide in regard to mosquitoes is a contact poison. So think about it this way. If you have a truck going up and down your street spraying and fogging for mosquitoes, if your mosquito is not at the front of your house, say it's in the backyard, that spray isn't going to do anything. But think about other things you've got in your front yard. You've got, oftentimes people like to show their flowers where there might be butterflies, there might be bees sleeping, um, mantids, whatever, that contact poison is fatal to those. The most, and, and more and more areas are finding that it's not cost effective. One of the uh, more recent ones in the last couple of years, the city of Brentwood here just out of St. Louis, um, over years of spraying has realized it's not cost effective. It's not serving any purpose. Much more important is education and dealing with the nesting sites um, where the females lay their egg. So all of these mosquitoes require some sort of water. So as I said, tires, it's very difficult to you know, get water out of a tire and you know, drill some holes in the tires in order to get that water drained. If you, know, you leave any sort of toys out, buckets, wagons, <clears throat> some of these uh, depending upon the conditions and how warm it is, can go through uh, pretty much a complete metamorphosis in a week or even less. So you need to make sure that everything is dumped of water, you know, grills, pet dishes. Uh, this was actually one uh, several years ago. I got a call from a person who was concerned that they had all of these things in their uh, pet bowl for their cats. And they were concerned that their uh, pet, their cat had worms. And 
she described the situation to me. I said, you know, is it outside? Do you, how often do you change it? And what I eventually pointed out to her, well, actually, it sounds like mosquito you know, larvae that are in there. Um, and their vet couldn't figure out. And she went to her vet to tell him the vet was ecstatic and because then now they realized it's just a matter of cleaning out those uh, pet bowls because what many of these mosquitoes are looking for is that standing water where you get some algae and bacteria buildup because many of these mosquito larvae are filter feeders. So they're feeding on whatever's growing there. So those water areas, so any sort of litter, tires, you know, pet dishes, leaky hoses, trash cans, gutters. This is the most effective way of removing the areas where those mosquitoes can breed. And as I said, you know, tires are one of the worst. And unfortunately, you know, we have huge tire piles in almost every city. Um, but, you know, if you do see a tire bump, dump, you know, city of St. Louis, you can actually contact them to let them know about illegal tire dumping. Um, or if, you know, you've tried doing the old fashioned swing with kids or grandkids or community kids, whatever, drill some holes in those tires to drain the water. Uh, because 80s will pick this, this is one of the best nesting sites for it. So if you have an area that's holding water that you cannot get to um, or drain it out, there is a chemical that you can use, which is fairly specific towards mosquitoes. It's called BTI, Bacillus thuringiensis, Israelensis, which is the subspecies originally discovered in Israel. And the spores that this uh, bacteria produces affects mosquitoes, black flies, fungus gnats, and it really causes perforations in the gut so they cannot digest properly. Um, it is harmless to vertebrates, um, mammals, birds, reptiles, fish, etc. Um, you can easily get them as dunks or in granular form. I recommend this only in areas where you don't have a natural habitat. So this is for areas like if you've got, you know, some sort of cistern that you cannot drain, uh, put in these dunks to deal with mosquito larva. But there's a caution in treating them in a natural system because BTI, it is very effective on mosquitoes and black flies, et cetera, but other related species like chironomid larva, but and even unrelated like Daphnia, water fleas, it's actually a type of crustacean, can also be susceptible to BTI. And the problem is things like chironomid larvae are such important components of food webs that by treating a natural system, you can completely disrupt the food web and that's going to affect songbirds, you know, amphibians, bats, fish, what have you. So I only recommend using BTI in a closed or confined system, a non-natural system. Uh, sewers are going for that, where you're not going to be dealing with a natural system. Now, there are ways that you can kind of short circuit this whole thing and deal with mosquitoes right off the bat. You can create a, a homemade mosquito trap. This is specifically um, most important for Culex. Culex is the house mosquito. Um, it is a very common vector for um, West Nile and a number of other diseases. I've used this uh, a number of times with great effect. Get a bucket or some container, put some water in there, add some leaves or grass clippings or other vegetation. This starts the process going to start producing bacteria and algae. Leave it for several days. Then look in there and look for rafts. So Culex lay their eggs in these rafts, which look like about the size of a sesame seed. So you'll see these individual rafts. You know, I remember one time looking in one bucket I'd set up and I counted some 75 rafts. So what you're doing is causing the female to use up all its energy, producing all of these eggs. And then what you can do, once you have all of these eggs, then just dump that bucket on your lawn. Uh, this kills, you know, the, the larva cannot survive. Um, you've been watering your lawn, um, or for some reason you can't dump it right away, treat it with some BTI. But this is a very simple way to short circuit and reduce the population growth of mosquitoes. Now, sometimes that type of plant, and this is also where we get into the types of plants that you grow in your gardens, 
and if they get into any sort of standing water, there are certain types of plants which actually improve uh, emergence and production of mosquitoes. So we look at invasive plants like autumn olive and Almer honeysuckle, you get 84 and 86% emergence of Culex pipians house mosquito eggs. So if you have these in your area, first off, I recommend it horribly invasive, but when they get into water systems, that actually can increase your population of um, mosquitoes. Whereas many of our natives like blackberry and elderberry, very low emergence. Uh, service berry is interesting because it has high emergence, but they lay fewer eggs. But you can see there's a benefit, another benefit for keeping native plants in your garden. Now for 80s elbow pictus, you can purchase this trap. Um, you can try making it yourself, but it's easy enough to purchase. It's called a GAT trap. GAT standing for gravid 80s trap. And the same principle holds like for the Culex. You've got this bucket, you fill it with water, a little bit of vegetation, but it has this upper area with this cone. 80s are uh, what are called cavity nesters. They look for an opening. So like there's a, a hole in a tree um, that was created by something either due to rot or whatever, and it holds water. That's where they're going to nest. This is why they were came in with uh, uh, automobile tires. That is a cavity. So what this does, this dark funnel on top attracts them. Uh, they smell the rotting vegetation. So it smells good for the bacteria and fungus to raise their kids. They go in. Most of them have a net, so they actually can't lay their eggs, but then they try to escape and this translucent area, they fly towards the light and they can't get out. Uh, many of the newer traps also have a little sticky trap too, so it starts catching them. One trap we had uh, one year, um, I thought it was very successful, but all I could ever find were the wings of the adults. Well, we found out later that the ants had discovered this trap and they were going in and feeding on all of the, uh, the dead mosquitoes and all they left were the wings. So this publication of the Xerxes Society is actually very good uh, from a community level uh, way to start talking about effective mosquito management, dealing with wetland areas, you know, avoiding pesticides. So this one uh, you can download from Xerxes Society's website. So the general take home message for pollinators in general, and of course, for the, uh, the flies, you want diverse plantings. Of course, reducing use of insecticides and herbicides and get rid of plantings. But I think more importantly, learn and understand the needs of these, particularly the beneficial flies, but also just learn to start understanding and appreciating flies in general because of all the services that they perform. So whether it's due, whether they're decomposing and helping to break down stuff, removing dead animals, or pollinating our crops, pollinating our flowers, or feeding on their insect pests. So start learning more and more about the flies. And there are a few additional references for finding uh, what to plant and how to learn about flies. Pollinator Partnership, you go to their website, you can put in uh, your zip code and it'll give you recommendations for planting lists, but their planting lists include bees, flies, birds, beetles, et cetera. So they specifically give some fly recommendations. Farm with native beneficial insects because we have been talking about particularly the, um, the surfids, the flower and hoverfly. This book also through Xerxes, particularly for larger areas. And if you're really dealing with you know, agricultural systems, this is a really good book to talk about all the benefits and all the different types of beneficial insects. Um, whether it be you know, big-eyed bugs and pirate bugs uh, and wasps to the beneficial flies. If you want to learn specifically about flies, the Field Guide to the Flower Flies of Northeast of North America just came out now, ooh, I think four or five years ago. Um, very comprehensive. You really want to get into it. But the guide on the right I just discovered just recently, the Field Museum of Chicago, uh, produces some downloadable guides, and they do one of the flies of Illinois, which would cover also Missouri and surrounding areas, but it's a photographic guide. It's several pages long that you can download just to start identifying some of the various flies in your garden. For field guides, the one I recommend to most people if you're just starting out is the Kaufman Field Guide to Insects in North America, because a number of other field guides I find either have, they may have more in-depth information on certain insects, but they may not have as many. 
So like the section on flies, there's a pages and pages and pages of all different flies. So just this page on robber flies and the various genera, it gives you a starting point. It shows you the relative sizes and sometimes actual sizes, but this is a very handy guide for, you know, particularly for when I look at bees, uh, wasps, uh, flies, those groups which often aren't covered as well in other field guides. And if you really want to get into the exciting story of some of the flies, these uh, books which have come out over the last few years, The Secret Life of Flies, tell you the whole extraordinary story about what they are, what they do um, in different cultures, in research, in habitats, and then also Superfly, you know, the unexpected lives of the world's most successful insects. And then if you really get geeky about flies, there aren't a lot of just straight fly, you know, books out there but flies and natural history and diversity of diptera. So if you really want to get into flies, this is the book to get. Um, or if you know somebody's into flies, this is the book to get. And with that, hopefully you've got a, a better appreciation for flies, their diversity, um, what you can do, and how we really need to appreciate them more in our gardens. Uh, I have my, web, my uh, email address here in case you have additional questions, but we're now going to open it up to to Q&A and I will stop my sharing and see if there are any questions. Thank you very much, Ed, that was wonderful. This is Carol David, Executive Director of the Missouri Prairie Foundation and our Grow Native program. And we do have quite a number of, of questions um, and they're not in any particular order. Um, Greg asked, my question is that we put fruit peels into an enclosed dish before we get it to the compost. In the morning, we have fruit flies in the pot. How did they get in there if there is a lid on the dish? Are they in the peelings? Um, two things could have happened. One is that they could have laid eggs on the peelings before you got there. Or if you actually look really closely, um, there are, you know, if a fly lays its egg on there, there may be a space enough. So we have a little compost bin in our uh, I keep next to the sink where we put our peelings in too. And there's just enough space for a maggot to either climb down between the lid and the sidewall or even crawl through the kind of sponge-like filter. But it, it's amazing if, you know, they're very small um, and they will find their way in if you, you know, <laughs> if it isn't completely sealed, they can find their way in. Thank you. Um, a couple, a few questions here on flies and pollination. Flies don't look as hairy as bees. How can they be good pollinators? Um, in part because of, of the way they're working the, the flowers. So there are some which are relatively hairy, like the, the tachinids. Um, but for most of them, it's just their aspect of how they, they feed. So remember, they've got that kind of spongy mouth part. So it's kind of that sopping up and putting down at the same time, um, which helps to actually spread pollen within that flower or within the next one. Um, think of uh, kind of a sort of a similar example with bees are the um, leaf cutters. And particularly there's a couple species of Osmia, mason bees like Osmia georgica. And I'll see it tapping its abdomen on a flower to pick up the pollen. So just that action actually helps to spread pollen and pollinate. And the flies process of their feeding and their constantly doing, you know, that sopping up with their mouth parts is also the way they're uh, spreading pollen around. Thank you. Another question, how do flies eat pollen? So there it depends upon the species. So some like um, house flies and tachinids. Um, if you've ever seen, which I found very disturbing, the remake of the movie, The Fly with Jeff Goldblum, um, when he starts becoming a fly at the this one meal, he kind of pukes up on the food and then laps it up. This is actually a, a technique. So there is a layer of saliva um, and they are secreting it onto the pollen, which helps to digest it. And then they just lap it up. Thank you. Um, question, or maybe just, are you familiar with the flies that pollinate pawpaws? Um, I, I know that the pawpaws are fly pollinated. I've never actually looked into which flies are actually doing it. You know, the biggest issue with pawpaws is making sure you've got a male and a female in order for pollination services. And just as I would recommend for any crop, if you are dealing with a pollinator, so for example, 
If you're dealing with, you know, tomatoes, making sure you've got flowers that support the bumblebees for nectar. Similar with pawpaw, make sure you have some of these very uh, simple blossoms also scattered around that can also support the flies outside of the bloom period of the pawpaws. So it, it's, it's still that aspect of creating a complete diet for them and filling in those gaps when the pawpaws aren't in bloom. But yeah, I've not really looked at which particular species do the pawpaws. Thank you. There's several questions here about um, flies overwintering and how late they pollinate. Um, so the first, how late in the season do flies pollinate flowers and do any nectar later in the fall than bees do? Um, no, they're pretty much the same um, with the bees. So as long, you know, with unfortunately our, you know, increasing fall and later winter, you're seeing flies later and later. Uh, right now there's a uh, we have this one aster planted at the zoo. Um, it's actually not a native to North America, but it's a, a really, actually it's a pretty good one for uh, nectar and pollen, but it doesn't, it's not invasive. It's a Tatarian aster. They'll get to be four to five feet tall, kind of straight as an arrow. They don't spread out like a New England aster, but you look at them right now, you're going to see bees and flies. So as long as the weather is still amenable for them, just like with the bees, they're going to keep hanging on. So as long as there's flowers and as long as the weather's good, you're going to keep seeing them. There's, there's no real cutoff time. It's, it's really due to weather. Thank you. And how do different flies overwinter? So it varies. So there are some uh, that overwinter as pupa. Um, that this is also you know, a common way that uh, people store them too. So like with house flies, uh, they can withstand cooler temperatures and stay a while as a pupa. We, we feed house flies and flesh flies at the zoo. And so what they will often, you get the shipment of pupa and then we just stick them in the fridge. So during those colder temperatures, they will just kind of, you know, stabilize. Once they warm up, they'll emerge. So some will overwinter as pupa. Uh, some will overwinter as adults. So if they can find a place in uh, to just kind of stay and then, just like with a lot of other things, they're just kind of slowing down their metabolism and just getting cooler. Uh, the interesting thing is, you know, in our homes, we can find flies active at all different times because we just have a warmer environment uh, and they're just coming out earlier. So you know, you'll find flies in the middle of winter suddenly in you know, your window well, where they would have been fine before, but there's a nice warm spell. Um, or as I said, you know, we had the uh, the flesh flies in our basement, they just came in and there, for them, it would be a closed system that they couldn't actually survive long term because there was nothing for them to feed on. But either, most will either do it as a pupa or as an adult. Thank you. There's a question about um, garden cleanup kind of related uh, to flies overwintering. My very large vegetable garden has lots of native wildflowers throughout. I also use annual flowers in the garden. I know that pollinator gardens should be left until late spring for cleanup, but should I just remove vegetable plants or would it be better to leave the entire garden cleanup until next year? So for the flies where they're gonna be overwintering is, in, is gonna be in that leaf litter, that mulch and stuff, whereas we don't look at mulch and leaf litter as beneficial for um, bees. You know, they're going to be nesting in the stems or underground, you know, clear ground. Usually the flies and particularly the pupa are going to be in that, that leaf litter. So what I'd recommend is, you know, you can remove the, uh, some of those vegetables and uh, plants. There you need to think about the bees and cutting them a certain height. But for the flies and others which are going to be pupating on this, you know, under the leaf litter, it's just kind of leaving that. And you should be doing that anyway, just to protect the the surface of the soil for the winter. So you don't get, you know, either, you know, erosion um, or anything, you know, running off into streams. Um, so just having, you know, that, that leaf mulch on there and that's where the flies are gonna be. The upper portion you can clean up. So that's not a fly issue. It's really that, that mulch layer, which is important for the flies. Good, Good to know. Um, I'm gonna move on to a number of questions about specific flies. Um, Nancy asks, how do we attract the squash bug fly? Um, plant squash. So mm -hmm. they're, they're gonna be attracted. So I saw my first 
uh, here at my house. You know, the photograph that I took of them was actually at the zoo, um, that picture. But the first time I saw them here at our house was when I had a major outbreak of squash bugs. So last year when I planted squashes, you know, usually you get a few of the, the exotic marmorated stink bugs coming in. But last year I had you know, a lot of pure squash bugs are all gray in color and I had hundreds of them. Yeah, you know, I was going out with a, 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 a hand vac and sucking them all up, it was the easiest way. But it was that resource which actually attracted the flies. So because there was that prey species for its young, that's how it brought the squash bugs in. So you, know, you hate to say, well, the way to get squash bugs is, you know, the, the squash bug parasitoid is to put out squash bugs. There, I would just kind of do what you do. Um, if you have squash bugs, then that's what's going to attract the flies. I, it's not really a way to attract them, but you can still support the adults um, to check out your garden by planting things like goldenrod and other flowers, like you do for any other beneficial fly. Attracting them, giving them those food resources for the adults to hang around. And then if you do have some pests, then they can deal with them. Thank you. Um, Gail asks, I'm curious about the daffodil flies since daffodils are not native here. Right, so um, yeah, they're commonly called daffodil flies because, uh, well, there's two things. There, there is, um, we have actually a couple daffodil flies. Um, one is found both in Europe and in North America. Um, and because we've planted so many daffodils, the uh, European species seems to be uh, much more broadly you know, or expanding more. But they're really feeding on similar tuberous you know, flowers. So the maggots can be a little more general. So they're feeding actually on a few different species. It's just that we've planted so many daffodils that they tend to be just more abundant. And with the daffodil trade, we've actually introduced the European species too. Thank you. Um, are surfid flies, do they dissolve pollen with their saliva and then lap it up? Yes. Yeah, so they, they've also that spongy mouth part. Compared to the bee flies, as I so particularly, which is very obvious with that uh, slender bee fly, the garin, they are really uh, going for the nectar. So that's why they have that very long straight proboscis. So you'll see them hovering um, going for nectar, whereas the flower flies are usually landing directly on it. The bee flies are often, even still, if they seem to be landing, their wings are constantly moving in order to, you know, take off at a moment's notice, but they're not dealing with the pollen, they're just dealing with nectar. Thank you. Lisa asks, what are the flies that come in the house when you bring indoor plants indoors? So there are a couple ones that we often get. The fungus gnats are probably the most common one. So it is a, it's a gnat that feeds on, the maggots feed on rotting vegetation in the, the plants themselves. So this is one that's, you know, if you've brought in a house plant or brought, you know, if you have a house plant, you put it outside for a while, bring it inside. That's the one that I mostly see coming in on plants. You know, the other things which people have a tendency to call flies, like, like white flies actually is a bug, um, and it's actually not a true fly. It's interesting too, if you, if you look at the way we name things, the English names, if it has two names, it's that true animal. So housefly, two words. Dragonfly, one word. Butterfly, one word. You know, whitefly, one word. So we name things in English, Two names. So when we think about white flies, it is not a fly. Um, fungus gnats, a type of fly, two names. That is one that's usually brought in. And that's really in the vegetation itself and usually in the soil. That's the one I most commonly see that people bring in into their houses. Thank you. My husband and I saw an insect in flight. He thought it was a robber fly, but I thought it was a dragonfly. Does the former have a shorter tail and a bigger body? Yeah, so the uh, robber flies, some can be fairly good size, never as big as a dragonfly, but it does have a long slender abdomen, but not as long as a dragonfly. Even uh, 
Uh, the smallest dragonflies we have around here, and even the smallest damselflies um, would still have an abdomen longer than a hoverfly, I mean, a, a robberfly. Thank you. Do any other flies hover while feeding the way crane flies do? Uh, bee flies are the, the ones who commonly do this. I've, I've seen many a bee fly just hovering right above the plant. And that's why it's often <clears throat> tough to take a picture to because the wings are constantly vibrating. Um, but bee flies are the ones who are most readily seen just hovering with their wings beating, you know, ferociously while they're feeding on nectar. Thank you. Uh, there's a comment. I've been distressed the past few years to see tachinids. Am I saying that right? Tachinids to get getting my monarch caterpillars. Um, and, and that's the the issue. I mean, it, this is it's a natural system. It is a um, part of life. When we look at monarch caterpillars, or, or just think about you know, how many eggs on average need to be laid uh, to produce one adult. And some of the research shows that about 11, because throughout their entire life, the monarchs are bothered by something. So as eggs, you could have, you know, the aphid lions, the, the lacewing larva feeding on the eggs. Uh, you could have different uh, trichogrammid, uh, very small parasitoid wasps that could lay their eggs within the egg of a monarch. As a caterpillar, you would have everything from, again, the aphid lions to ambush bugs, to wheeled bugs, any of the predatory bugs, to wasps um, and you know, yellow jackets that would also be collecting those caterpillars to feed to their offspring. Uh, you may also eventually, you know, have the occasional bird, which then realizes this tastes bad, but you've also just lost a, a caterpillar. And then, of course, the diseases. So just like with every animal, they have to go through a lot of stuff before they get to, you know, a later stage and have higher survival. The thing with tachinid flies, you know, they um, are going to parasitize some of those. There have been, unfortunately, some issues, and this is... You know, we look at things like biocontrol, where uh, various insects have been brought in to deal with a pest insect. The what used to be called a gypsy moth, and I always forget the genus and species, but we don't use that name anymore. When it was eventually realized that that caterpillar was really no good for producing silk, and the researchers out in Connecticut just basically just dumped them. You know, as we know, that moth has become a major pest, feeding on a whole variety of things. What they did then is introduce a tachinid fly from Europe to deal with it. Unfortunately, the tachinids can be, many of them can be very general. Uh, this was before the time when we really do the research to see if it's very host specific. And unfortunately, a lot of those tachinids found are native silk moths, the Saturnids. So, you know, Promethea, Polyphemus, Luna, Cecropia, um, just as amenable to their young as. The, uh, the gypsy moth caterpillars. Um, and so that's why we've also lost a lot of our large silk moths too. You know, this is just an issue where if there's, you know, you'll go through boom and bust cycles with a lot of these insect species. So if there's a boom cycle with one caterpillar that may bring a lot of tachinids around, that may also, you know, be somewhat detrimental later on. But Oftentimes, like for me, when I see the tachinids emerging, it's late in the season, um, much later, the goldenrod is in bloom. And usually by that time, it's usually adult monarchs, which are starting to move south. It's not an issue for the adult monarchs. Um, if there was a late uh, breeding monarch, that could be problematic. But oftentimes, some of the tachinids that I'll see late in the season are those past the time that the monarchs are actually moving through. Thank you. Just a couple more questions about specific insects, and then we're going to move on to questions about the mosquito control. Sure. Um, there, you had a slide with, with a feather-legged fly. What was the tiny winged in insect to the right of that fly? It was a fly. Uh, I, couldn't <laughs> tell you, I couldn't tell you which one. Um, there's, there's these incredibly small flies, and I keep you know, wanting to look them up. There are these little tiny flies which will appear on uh, like almost anything recently dead. And as I said, I, I keep forgetting to look them up. I've photographed them many times. 
because I usually see them when an ambush bug has killed a, a bee. And whether that bee is something small like a mask bee or even something larger like a honeybee, it's like these little tiny, um, almost like the jackals of you know the, the fly world suddenly appear out of nowhere. And there, you know, you'll see these little tiny microscopic flies, you know, smaller than a fruit fly, you know, on these uh, animals. But I always forget to look them up. It's one of those things that, oh, I see it all the time. And I just forget to figure out what that actually is because I've got numerous pictures of them. Yeah. And that fly with the on the golden rod, uh, I also haven't looked up yet. A question uh, about once a year in the summer, there's an infestation of bottle flies in my apartment. Do you know what is causing this? Uh, there's something going on in your apartment. Um, so, so there's something, something either rotting or dead. Um, that's you know there is you know looking around, um, seeing if you know somebody actually left something, something left it out. Um, but they're usually going for rotting flesh um, or decaying matter. So um, I hate to say this, sounds like something's wrong in, in your apartment. You just need to kind of look it up and might be a neighbor. <laughs> All right, we're going to move into some of the mosquito questions now. Is there Are there native plants that you can use around a patio to repel mosquitoes? So there's a number of recommendations you can find out there. Um, lemongrass is one, which is commonly uh, talked about. It's not a native as a repellent. Um, any of these odiferous ones, like even chrysanthemums, I personally have not tried them. Um, we usually do a, a, a couple things at our house. One is we do we put out the traps for the Culex in the 80s. The other is mosquitoes are not ver really strong flyers. So if you can have any sort of wind movement, so a fan, so if you've got an outside area where you can have a ceiling fan or some other type of fan that just blows you know, in that area, those are actually, you know, when you're sitting out there, those are really common ones to deal with. The issue we often have with you know, just planting to you know, keep animals away, it's often never 100%. Because like the, the standard, you know, people talk about, oh, if you plant marigolds and around your garden and you'll keep the rabbits out. Easy example, when I used to live in Cincinnati, I had literally I had these two marigolds uh, two feet apart. One was eaten completely down by the rabbits and the other one was never touched. So we always talk about, you know, doing these, you know, sort of areas. I think for mosquitoes, it's really dealing with the uh, water resources um, where they're going to be nesting, setting up traps to reduce the reproduction. And then if you can have some sort of a uh, little bit of a fan in the area when you're outside, which oftentimes on a stagnant night is going to be better, better anyway. Thank you. Is there an industry that provides specific flies as predators for specific pests like aphids? Um, there are a number of companies which sell a variety of um, uh, different types of parasitoids. Um, Arbico is one that sells a number of different beneficials. And, oh, there's one that we, I used to use all the time. Um, but usually most of those are, are much more specific in their predator control. So things like, you know, spider mites, uh, trichogramids, wasps, those sorts of things, because Many of these flies can be fairly general, like I just talked about the tachinids. You don't usually see uh, various uh, groups producing those sorts of things, which can be very general. Um, historically, the various things have been used to control, you know, like med flies in California, very specialized parasitoids, but the, the generalist ones you don't tend to see. It's usually you deal with a, a trap um, or some other much more specialized insect. I'm, I'm trying to think of anyone, you know, yeah, people do sell house flies, they sell flesh flies, but both of those are usually for um, the, uh, the pet trade because that's what people will feed out. Mm -hmm. Several questions about the BTI, the mosquito dunks. Do mm -hmm. they affect butterflies if the butterflies drink the water where the dunk is? Um, no, because usually, you know, butterflies um, are, not ones that utilize uh, deeper water. Well, first off, the, the butterfly is not sensitive to that particular type. 
but where you're using BTI are in water areas that are going to be deeper. A butterfly needs something very shallow, um, or when you think about puddling, it could be just a damp area that they're going to be sucking up water or minerals from. Uh, they can't deal with, you know, if a butterfly lands on a, a large water surface, it's kind of SOL. You know, it's going to get its wings wet. It's going to be other issues. So one is it doesn't get exposure to BTI. And then the other is it doesn't affect them if they were to be exposed to it. Thank you. And what about, um, does it, would it, will BTI kill dragonfly larvae? No, the, the way it can affect dragonfly larvae is if you are using it in a natural system and you do have things like chironomids or even, you know, mosquitoes where the dragonfly is preying upon them because they are a predator. If you kill off the prey, then you lose the dragonflies. Mm -hmm. So there's the issue. That's why I really say really only use BTI and those sorts of uh, very specific compounds in not a natural system. Because if you've got a good, healthy natural system with dragonfly naiads, um, with um, some of the, actually the, the chironomid uh, larva actually feed on mosquitoes and fish and other things, you really want to keep that natural balance. And that's going to deal with it as opposed to trying to put in a chemical like BTI. Thank you. And as you mentioned before, they are BTI is safe to use in bird baths. Yep. But um, for the bird bath, you should, you know, ours get just kind of gunky anyway. Um, so we just, you know, clean them out very regularly. So if you're, right, if you're yeah. cleaning a bird bath out at least once a week, it shouldn't be an issue. Yeah, I think a lot of it just being aware, being outside in your yard and looking right. and to see if, if water's collecting anywhere. And just, I, I think another uh, thing, you know, for native for gardening enthusiasts, you might have empty pots lying around, you know, outside your garage or, you know, under your steps. And uh, that's something to always go through and turn upside down and get the water out of, you know, rainwater. Or that, um, or that little tray that you put a pot on. Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, question about uh, if you do have a kind of a more natural pond, like a, a dinner table size backyard pond, um, she has plants growing in and around it. Um, is there a good way to avoid raising mosquitoes in a, a backyard pond like that? Yeah, so you can, um, you know, some is just, you know, making it more amenable, putting in you know, vegetation within the pond that uh, is a an area for laying for dragonflies and damselflies. Um, there are other various fish that you can put in. So like a friend of mine, he has a little pond um, and, he, and he actually wants the, uh, the maggots because he collects them and feeds them to his turtles. Uh, but um, when sometimes if you want to control them, what he does, he actually uh, always keeps a, some guppies. Um, he puts the guppies out during the, the season to feed on the mosquito larva. And then in the winter, it brings them into his fish tank. So there are various fish that you can also use as a control measure that you just keep a you know, tank inside. But eventually, if you're in an area where um, you do start seeing more damselflies and dragonflies, they should hopefully just start you know, populating that area. Because a lot of people, when they start doing these, it's happened in zoos where you make a nice area for them, eventually they do start showing up. But it also means having some emergent vegetation in those, uh, in your pond in order for uh, damselflies and dragonflies to lay their eggs. Sometimes they'll actually insert them directly into the plant. So looking at and learning what the dragonflies and damselflies in the area are, are also important. Thank you. What about mosquito fish? Uh, the gambusia, yeah. You, um, often people, um, and, and there are some actually some native gambusia too, <clears throat> but used to, I've, I've not purchased some in a, a while, but you know, it used to be readily available to get some gambusia to put out there. Um, they're, you know, we're not getting the cold winters like we used to, so they actually might be able to tolerate even our winters. But oftentimes we're getting it may not be cold all winter long, but we suddenly get a hard freeze or dump you know, a bunch of snow, and that's going to affect the pond. So, but you can also pull them out and just have them in a nice fish tank for the winter, and then put them back out in the spring. Thank you. We had a number of questions about your slide about uh, the the invasive plants versus the native plants and and uh, mosquito egg laying and, and development. 
So can you clarify, like with the serviceberry and elderberry, how does it affect mosquitoes? Um, just can you elaborate a bit more on the, right. those relationships? So each of these plants, you know, any plant that you know, breaks down in water or anything that breaks down in water releases certain chemicals. So the, the chemicals that are released <clears throat> in the breakdown are either causing you know, a, an increased attractiveness, um, which could be everything from increasing bacteria and algae growth that allows for more food to be produced in the system, um, or um, as a chemical cue that brings those mosquitoes in. So it, that's where you know, it's the actual chemical breakdown of those plants, because that's what's actually happening in the water. So it's the, those chemical cues that are, are doing it. And then some of those chemicals are just, you know, maybe attractive in order to attract the mosquitoes, but they may actually be inhibiting some of that bacteria and algae for growing. That's why for some species, you have very low emergence because there's not enough food for the uh, mosquito larva to feed on, but it smells really good for the females. So the females are going by the chemical cues to find the water. They're laying in that water itself. But if the plant is inhibiting growth of algae and bacteria, that's what's reducing the emergence. So it depends upon the plants and the chemical composition that it's releasing in the water. If, hopefully that makes sense. Yes, it does. Thank you. Uh, back to one more BTI question. I have a multi-layer fountain that is modified so my honeybees can drink from the upper level and birds bathe in the lower level. Can I use BTI in that fountain? It won't, will it hurt the, the honeybees? Um, it shouldn't hurt them, but when you have moving water like that, it shouldn't, um, and particularly if it's a recirculating system, it shouldn't be, you shouldn't really have a mosquito problem. Um, easy ways to, you know, mosquitoes really kind of like stagnant water, not moving water. So that's not attractive for the females to lay in. And also, if you've got a, a tiered system, many of those are recirculating. So it's actually just going to be sucking the animals through and through. So I, I, would, I would imagine you wouldn't really have an issue with mosquitoes with your uh, fountain. Um, I would first look, if, if you need to put in BTI, it shouldn't be an issue. But I don't think you really would have an issue with mosquitoes in there. Thank you. A um, couple of questions about your work in particular, Ed. Um, mm -hmm. Greg says, I'm fascinated with your talk and what goes through my mind is when, why, and how did you decide to become an expert in flies? I love your talk. Um, well, actually I'm more of an expert at bees, but Carol said, hey, can you do a talk on flies? <laughs> so um, I did write an article for um, Missouri Prairie Foundation on flies. And flies because of pollination services, I do talk a lot about pollination. So like later tonight, I'm giving a talk on uh, farming practices uh, for this other class for you know, farming but for beneficial insects and biodiversity. And part of that is attracting you know, bees, but it's also attracting flies, it's attracting birds. So I, I tend to look at you know, a whole system. You know, so my background is actually, you know, even though it's behavior and population genetics, I used to do a lot of mammal work. So I have a lot of knowledge and appreciation of mammals. I've worked with every group of animals and zoos. Um, I really love bison. That's why the picture behind me. Um, I'm Fort Belknap, you know, any reservation in Montana. Um, but I tend to try to look more holistically at a system. So if, you know, we're planting a garden, my wife and I here, or we're doing something at the zoo, you know, I don't focus on just well, what's going to attract this bumblebee? No, what is going to attract pollinators? And since pollinators include those flies, how do we attract those? Um, it's also attracting wasps. So steel blue cricket hunters, golden digger wasps, um, little bronids, any of those things. So I just tend to look at biodiversity and the system. So I wouldn't necessarily call myself a fly expert. I have a great appreciation. I can you know, educate people more about flies. Um, but I'm really trying to look at more holistic, and that's, I think, how we should be looking at our gardens, our farms, and the, all, the whole aspect of biodiversity. That's the only thing that's going to maintain our prairies, it's going to maintain our farms, are going to maintain our, even our gardens and our, and our homes. Thank you. 
And anonymous attendee says, Ed, your photos are marvelous. I have to ask, what camera or photo editor do you use to capture the detail on these tiny flies? Uh, so it varies. So most of that is actually with an older uh, Nikon D40X with a 105 uh, Nikon uh, uh, macro lens. Uh, and the, the biggest issue you usually have with macro photography is light. And Nikon, I really like Nikon because they have these speed lights that you can actually attach directly to the lens so I can move them around. So I've got two speed lights, so it gives additional light right at the image. But as I tell people, I gave a talk um, last week on, on my other programs and one of the questions was, well, how do you get these pictures of bees and other things? Some of it is just patience. So learning what the behaviors are, where to find them. So if you know that certain you know, bees and flies are gonna use a certain type of plant, that's where you hang out. If you <clears throat> um, know uh, that they're gonna be a little bit leery about your movement, learning how to either move more slowly or situate yourself in an area where they're going to eventually show up for you. Because I've used that Nikon, um, I've used a smaller digital Olympus, um, for some bee pictures like this year, I got uh, some very nice pictures of Bombus fraternus, the Southern Plains bumblebee, with my phone. And I always tell people, it's a phone, it's not a camera. Um, but it's the only thing I had. And actually, I got some very nice pictures of a species which is listed on the IUCN red list as endangered. Um, you don't see it all that often here in Missouri, but it is a native species. And I photographed at the zoo. So a lot of it is just patience knowing what it is, knowing what to look for, and what the animals can also tolerate too, um, particularly for movement. That's often one of the big things with flies is that they, because those big eyes, they see you coming and they just fly right off. So learning how to kind of work with the animals, you know, just like taking kids' pictures. What's a kid gonna tolerate? What's a fly gonna tolerate? Thank you, Ed. And we're going to need to wrap up here in a moment, but um, there are a few questions about um, references. And uh, just to reassure everyone, we will uh, be able to send a link to a recording of Ed's presentation to you tomorrow. And so you, you'll be able to see uh, those slides again that he, he mentioned uh, that they were uh, uh, there was a pollinator article that you mentioned, Ed, that um, someone wanted the full reference for. And maybe you, if you could just email that to us, Ed, then um, Brooke can include that in the email that will go out tomorrow. Okay. Yeah. Just uh, remind me which one it was because it referenced a few different ones. So just let me know which one and I can send that to you. Yeah. I'm not sure. I, I'm wondering if it was um, the one you that. Fly showed, pollination or? Um, I think it was. And it, there was a graphic that showed the bee group, the, excuse me, the fly groups that are that were most important for pollinating. Okay, yeah. I think that might have been the one that she was asking about, but okay. I'm not sure. Yeah, I can send that to you. And um, Ed wrote a really nice article for us a few years ago on gardening for bumblebees and also um, for uh, gardening for native flies. And we can send links to those as well. And Ed, did you did you just mention another B article that you had written? I know you mentioned you you wrote the fly article, but I wasn't. I wrote sure. the fly and the bumblebee. Um, and it was oh, for someone else. Tell. Okay, all right, very good. Um, well, thank you everyone for joining us and for your great questions and participation. And Ed, thank you so much for an absolutely wonderful presentation with great information for us to. Um, be more and 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 your 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 message of being more aware of flies and and how we're how we are uh, accommodating them or welcoming them and also look for water <laughs> look for water in pots and so many other places around our our yards. Right. Thanks again, uh, Ed. We really appreciate your time and expertise. And thanks everyone for joining us. We do have another webinar next week on contemporary art and the prairie. We'll have a panel of three different artists. I'm really looking forward to it and I hope you'll join us for that as well. So good night, everyone. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.